So what does it mean to release open source software? Let's consider the definition of the word release. What sorts of things might you release? Well, if you were a government, you might release the prisoners. If you're a bank, you might release the funds. If you're a musical artist, you might release the recording. If you're a train engineer, you might release the handbrake. Of course, if you were a god, you might release the kraken. And what do all of these things have in common? It's the concept of a quantity or thing which is constrained, held back somehow, and then is liberated or set free into wider circulation. So when we speak of releasing the software, what we mean is that during development, the number of people who have access to that software uh, is limited. It's the development group. And then after release, the uh, software is available to the wider public. So our working definition of releasing, in our case, open source software is the act of making software available outside of the development group. Let's next consider the concept of uh, software release versus a publication under copyright law. So here's a excerpt from Title 17 uh, where we see that it's roughly analogous in that there's the concept of distribution of copies to the public. Uh, they also, the copyright law makes note of the intent of the publisher expressed here in terms of the offering to distribute uh, copies to a group of persons. And then there's also the Berne Convention on Copyright, uh, which also makes uh, note of the intent to publish. Uh, however, a release is not quite the same thing as a publication under copyright law. Uh, consider obtaining software from public version control between releases. I think we would all agree that software from there is a work in progress. It's not a release. However, there is a question as to whether or not that is a publication under copyright law. The problem here is that copyright law is not really tuned for open development and uh, Apache-style collaboration in a public internet space. So Apache has a formal process which distinguishes released software product from unreleased work in prog uh, progress software product. And let's consider some of the steps uh, which uh, distinguish that. So uh, there's a prerequisite to releasing software. First, you have to have a code base. And that code base is developed incrementally by an Apache community which is supervised by a project management committee which has been sanctioned by the foundation. Uh, at some arbitrary point in time, a release manager from the community steps forward and volunteers to prepare artifacts. These are drawn from the code base which the, uh, uh, which the community is developing. And the essential core of these artifacts is one or more compressed source archives. Uh, there is then a, uh, the community inspects the artifacts and then conducts a release vote uh, which expresses the vetting of the artifacts. And uh, that vote must pass. Notably, the vote is to release the specific artifacts and not, say, a tag on version control. The process is independent of uh, any particular version control technology. Once the vote passes, the next step is to inject the, uh, the artifacts into distribution channels. Canonically, that means the Apache Mirror system, which holds all of the recent releases, and then also archive.apache.org, which holds all releases from all time. Once that uh, release is propagated, then the next step is to make uh, the public aware of the release. Canonically, that means uh, posting a link on the uh, user-facing download page for the project, uh, sending email announcements to a number of lists. Uh, it may also involve any number of other ways of making the public aware, such as blog posts or press releases or, and so on. And then finally, when uh, you've reached the end of the process and it's time to celebrate the imminent arrival of many bug reports. So let's go over some of these steps in more detail, uh, starting with the, uh, the artifacts. Uh, for practical release reasons, the uh, release manager is typically a committer because you're going to have to commit, uh, make some commits. Uh, however, it is not necessarily a core developer for the project. In fact, it is in some ways desirable that it not be a core developer, uh, a developer for the project. Some projects have very complex builds. Others have managed to script the build. Uh, the reason that it's nice to have a non-core developer serve in the capacity of release manager is that uh, 
you broaden the knowledge base. You get other people involved, uh, and you teach them about corners of the code base which they may not know. And so uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, releasing software, the motivations for releasing software, uh, of course we want to make uh, useful software available to the general public. But uh, Apache communities are refreshed by uh, outsiders coming and becoming contributors. So, and, and people also who are contributors ramping up their contributions. So uh, for, uh, we, yes, we do want to make re uh, useful software available, but we also, uh, releases are an opportunity to refresh the community and enrich the community. Now let's consider the specifics of the release vote. Uh, so releases are for outsiders. Uh, and so the invariants are that we have a, a community vetting process, which is then expressed as the, the vote. Uh, all the members of the community are encouraged to vote, but we say that PMC votes are binding, which is a euphemism as for those, the ones that count. But we deploy the more polite euphemism because we really do want uh, people to, uh, to participate in that. We want to encourage people. And although uh, uh, the PMC votes are the ones which are technically binding, if someone from the community finds a, uh, a, a serious flaw, that will surely cause uh, uh, a number of PMC plus ones to flip to minus ones, and then the release will not take place. So it is worthwhile for people to uh, uh, participate in the vote, even though they may not be uh, uh, PMC members. The rule is that at least three binding votes must be in favor, and that illustrates that uh, you can't have a solo project at the Apache Software Foundation. You need to have at least three P active PMC members. And uh, the vote is by, there must be a majority, and there must be more plus ones than minus ones, and that's a little unusual when you consider some other votes that take place at the foundation, which are we say, usually say consensus, which what we mean is that of all the people that are participating in the vote, which is not necessarily all the people who are eligible, that all of those people must vote plus one. So we use majority vote for, uh, or majority rule for releases though, because we don't really want there to be vetoes on uh, uh, software releases. Uh, what we're trying to avoid is the anti-pattern of an individual holding out uh, for the integration of a pet feature into the product before it gets released. Uh, we do allow vetoes on, uh, on code contributions or commits, and so, uh, uh, but when it is time to actually release the software, we want to, we, the people who, who uh, created this policy determined that this was the best way to keep the communities healthy. Uh, we require that there are at least 72 hours for the vote to take place. Well, actually, it's not technically a requirement. It is a, uh, a guideline, and there may be circumstances under which uh, that guideline may be uh, changed. Uh, I actually have not seen that myself. I, I suppose that uh, theoretically it actually is for, say, a fast-moving security release, for example. It's, there we go, all right. Um, to me, it seems like, can you explain the difference? It seems like a very subtle difference between not vetoing a release and, not, and being able to veto a commit because a commit is on the way to a release, so, um, or it could be on the way to a, to a release. So maybe explain how those things differ because it seems very subtle to me. Well, notably, all of these circumstances are actually pretty rare. I mean, you don't, a, a, cont a contended vote, uh, release vote is something which only happens once in a blue moon in Apache. I'm, I'm not even sure I've actually seen a contended release vote pass. Uh, uh, I'm sure it's happened though. I mean, we've had done so many thousands of releases. So um, the, I, I think it's, it's different stages of the development process. Uh, once again, I'm actually sort of winging it here because I haven't seen somebody uh, do this for a for a, uh, uh, for a release vote. I mean, as, far, as long as I've been at the Apache Software Foundation, I'm a, uh, I became a member in 2011. So I wasn't seeing the, uh, the antisocial behavior that motivated this particular uh, pattern. Presumably that happened back in, say, 1999, when these, uh, uh, these uh, policies were being formulated. 
But as far as, uh, uh, there certainly have been uh, uh, code vetoes that uh, uh, take place. Uh, uh, and those are, are difficult circumstances. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think they're, you know, they're often unique. I mean, it's, you know, everyone has got the, uh, there's, I'm sure there's a pattern, but there's, uh, uh, you know, they're very unique circumstances. And so when you get to uh, the release portion, you just want things to flow smoothly. You don't want, that, uh, if somebody's counting on the release coming out, then you don't want people at that point for uh, uh, a company that's heavily invested in that stuff to get uh, coming out, uh, to get blocked by some indivi single individual on the PMC. Okay, so let's see. One of the reasons that we do the 72 hour window is uh, uh, say that we were to do a 12 hour window. Then only people on one half of the globe would uh, have a good uh, window in which to take part. So we want to avoid geographic favoritism. That's just a general principle of Apache. Another thing is that we want uh, to avoid favoring paid developers. Uh, and so uh, uh, that's why we have the release vote go long enough that people who are not always watching their email list and always making that particular project their top priority, that they'll still have time to participate. And finally, about the uh, release vote, it is the PMC voting is what makes the uh, release an official act of the foundation, something that is performed by the corporation from a legal standpoint. And let's consider what that means. Uh, so the uh, Apache Software Foundation is a nonprofit corporation which is uh, in the, in chartered in the state of Delaware. There are over 400 members of the foundation, and those are akin to shareholders. Uh, but you don't get membership by buying shares in the ASF. The mechanism is that uh, other members will nominate, and then the membership will have a vote once a year. This happens in June at a members meeting. Sometimes it happens twice a year, but it's usually once. Uh, and that's how other people become members. Crucially, the members uh, elect the board of directors and the board is then empowered to act on behalf of the corporation. And one of the, uh, one of the things which, we, which the board does is they pass resolutions establishing projects, including a uh, project management committee to watch over that project and a vice president to whom tasks may be delegated and who serves as a conduit between the, for communication between the board and the project. And what all of this does is, uh, uh, is enable the uh, uh, conferring of indemnity on the people who are in, uh, involved in the release process. Most conspicuously, that's the release manager who is the one that actually is preparing the artifacts because that individual is most exposed uh, to potential lawsuits. But it also uh, can include other PMC members taking part in the vote uh, uh, or potentially others as well. Now, Admittedly, that is a fair amount of bureaucracy in order to achieve the indemnity and uh, maintaining that corporate structure uh, and keeping all the records up to date. There's a lot of I's that must be dotted, a lot of T's that must be crossed. And meanwhile, out in the wider world, and a lot of open source gets released independently without the benefit of a foundation. So it's worth asking, why do we uh, uh, go to all this trouble? Or put it differently, what could go wrong? Well, let's consider a potential infringement scenario. Uh, so you, somebody files a bug, and then they are, it's requested that they attach a sample case. And so they do so, and then uh, that sample case is integrated into an Apache product, and I think you know what's coming. Uh, so once the uh, release is made, then the PMC is voted for it. It's an act of the foundation. There's no going back. It's a done deal. Well, as you might expect, it turns out in this case, the individual who supplied the sample case to the bug report was uh, uh, not the owner of that intellectual property. And so uh, the copyright showed up on, the owner showed up on legal discuss, and it turns out that that particular document was not available under any open source license, and so that copyright owner had all remedies available to them under copyright law that they qualified for. And this isn't theoretical. This happened a few months ago to Apache POI. Now, uh, uh, in this case, it was settled without uh, escalating to a court case. Uh, but that's not really something we want to count on. Because consider that not all open source uh, intellectual property disputes are resolved amicably. 
uh, Google versus Oracle, which involves, of course, Apache Harmony, so it hits close to home. There's all the SEO Linux, the forest of lawsuits surrounding that. There's the uh, uh, AOL's dispute with Game, uh, the instant messenger, which is now Pigeon. Uh, that's, so that's a trademark dispute. And then, so we've got copyright and trademark, and then if uh, you work in the search space like I do, you've probably encountered patent trolls with regards to uh, uh, faceted search. There's one who's going after everybody they can for that. So uh, we've got all aspects of intellectual property can result in, uh, in, in lawsuits. And the thing is, this does happen, or there are lots of, there's lots of open source that gets released and there's no consequences. But when somebody loses, somebody loses big. Uh, so it is a low risk but high cost scenario and uh, deep pocketed companies who may be sponsoring development at the Apache Software Foundation, they greatly value this indemnification uh, process because if it is their employee who is serving as a uh, release manager, uh, and then they're on the hook if something goes wrong. And uh, so they would uh, very much prefer to have the indemnification provision. And in fact, that's part of the Apache brand from the standpoint of people who are looking to invest in open source developer time, uh, which as Mark Hinkle said at yesterday's keynote, is increasingly the norm for uh, how uh, development is done in open source. So the Apache Software Foundation has a reputation for a certain level of diligence with regards to handling intellectual property, which along with our governance model, uh, our known governance model, uh, which is probably the least worst way to have competitors collaborate on a common code base, uh, and our stability and our longevity makes us a known quantity and a sa relatively safe place to invest in sponsored development. And that yields a competitive advantage in the race for open source uh, development hours, uh, which once again, the contributor hours are what are the lifeblood of any open source project. And so uh, there are plenty of independent projects, GitHub source on source search or any, uh, lots, of, lots of places that are also great and that are also equally diligent with regards to intellectual property and uh, perhaps have even uh, great governance mechanisms and so on. Uh, but from the perspective of someone who's looking to invest in open source, it takes research and time to deliver uh, or to determine which of those projects are suitable for you. Whereas if you know that a project is branded as Apache, there's a certain amount that you already know about it. So it's less expensive to assess uh, the viability of a project you might uh, invest in. And uh, that's why the members of the uh, foundation who look after the foundation as a whole and the board of directors are determined that uh, every project at the Apache Software Foundation will exercise a base level of diligence because if a single project is actually allowed to violate those rules, then that uh, damages the, uh, uh, the reputation of the foundation as a whole. Let's now consider the uh, criteria by which people are supposed to judge uh, a release candidate, whether voting yes or no. Well, it turns out that's kind of hard to figure out. We have an awful lot of documentation. Uh, there is, and it's sometimes contradictory, we have, there is an official release policy page that you'll find under www.apache.org slash dev slash releases.html. Uh, and then we've got, in addition to that, we have all of the documentation that the Legal Affairs Committee maintains. Then we have the incubator website, which was one of the only things that Shane Kirkaroo could find that was hateful at the, at the ASF at last night's uh, 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 lightning talks. Uh, and then we have infrastructure documentation, which refers to things such as uh, uh, how to manage your GPG keys, how to upload stuff to, uh, 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 to dist.apache.org, and the mechanics of releases, which is something quite close to policy or policy. So uh, there's a lot to take in. And something else that is uh, worth being in mind, if you look at the history of the releases policy page, it was originally the releases FAQ. Uh, and so that document evolved organically uh, because go back to the early days of the foundation when there were far fewer projects. Well, it's less important that uh, policy be codified carefully when there are, uh, are only a few num uh, small number of projects because the people who have laboriously developed that policy are never too far away. 
But these days, we have a somewhat larger core of people that understand policy, but a vastly expanded periphery of projects that are some ways quite distant from the people who know the policy intimately. And so for those people who are out there on the periphery, this sometimes discovering policy in the forest of uh, documentation can be a large cost. And that releases FAQ, uh, FA, the releases policy maintains an FAQ style uh, to this day, which is somewhat verbose, imprecise, and hard to interpret, and also subject to the phenomenon of policy creep, where somebody adds an FAQ to the list, and then later someone interprets that as policy, and then there's an argument as to whether or not that actually is policy or is not. Uh, and so the consequence of all that imprecision and confusion is you know, increasing policy arguments over time that you know, get resolved by scouring the email uh, archives for board member pronouncements on legal discuss or maybe even uh, poddling developer lists from 2006 or so. And so this is so painful that people come to hate rules as a general principle. And even if you try to do something about this and codify, clarify rules, people are like, no, no more rules. Rules make things awful. So it's, it's, a, it's a real kind of a difficult uh, place to be in. So my contention is that the releases policy would be better served if it was actually phrased in terms of, instead of FAQs, but in terms of imperatives such as should, must, may, may not. Because then we would have something uh, clear. Well, it's a beautiful dream. Let's consider now uh, what the incubator uh, does for releases. Uh, Last November and December, the incubator went to the trouble of assembling a checklist of what are the truly required items for, uh, uh, for releasing at Apache, because that was not actually documented in any one place. Uh, and this actually took quite some time. Uh, but that, then uh, once we had assembled that, then we could determine from that of that group what is truly required for an incubating release. And what constitutes an incubating release, how the standards are to be relaxed, is something which has historically been controversial. If you go back to the early days of the incubator, releases were not even allowed. Uh, but then they said, OK, people can be, uh, they can release software, but it has to have disclaimers. Uh, we may have some uh, relaxed criteria. Well, the other thing we did in November or December in the, uh, in the incubator was we came up with a new test. This was. Uh, uh, proposed by, I'm going to mangle this name, uh, uh, but board member Bertrand, uh, or Bertrand de la Carte, something like that. If there was a French person in the room, maybe Jacopo or somebody who can <laughs> correct my pronunciation. Anyway, board member Bertrand. Uh, then the test is, will this put the foundation at risk? An example of stuff which is required as far as the releases policy documentation, which won't, is you're actually supposed to check. Uh, 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 PMC members who vote on a project are supposed to download the source archive, build the source archive, verify that the unit tests run uh, and, and pass. Well, uh, uh, is it going to put the foundation at risk if the failing, uh, there are failing tests? Well, clearly not. Another example would be what we call licensing documentation bugs. And uh, by this we mean, say, missing source headers or excessive information in the, uh, in the notice file, uh, which uh, uh, now this is distinct from what we might call a licensing violation, which would be incorrect or, uh, uh, information or missing required information in the notice file. But uh, uh, say that a, you have a missing source header, that the, the content of that document has been uh, released by its or, or uh, uh, has been licensed by its copyright owner to the wider public and to the foundation to everybody under the Apache license. It's just that we haven't documented as such, so it's still safe to use that property. We just haven't said so. So that once again is a licensing documentation bug. It's not something which has to be a blocker uh, for an incubating release. So uh, finally, the incubator had arrived at a consensus of the definition for what an incubating release was, uh, or what the, the incubating qualifier on a release meant. And so this actually allowed us it, uh, to uh, uh, greatly rationalize the process of iterating on, uh, on, on incubating release candidates. Now, instead of forcing people to go through a, a large number of release candidates. I believe the record is held by Kafka at nine. Uh, the, we now say to people, 
uh, if there, is there something uh, uh, which puts the foundation at risk, please go redo it, or something that is you know, severe, please go redo it. Then, uh, but if, it, if there is something which violates policy at the Apache Software Foundation, we then uh, ask this test, and if it is not going to put the foundation at risk, then we document that the policy was violated, we report that, uh, the, uh, uh, the exception that we are making in our board report, and then we simply ask them to file a bug ticket and uh, fix it in the next incubating release. And that has been uh, quite good for the incubator uh, in terms of uh, uh, the amount of uh, time that gets spent on those things and the amount of arguing that we do. So I think we've arrived at a pretty good place. Uh, uh, we now have a, a clear policy, at least as far as that checklist is concerned. There is certainly a great need for uh, uh, improved documentation in the wider sphere. But we have a clear policy uh, within that limited scope. And then we have a sane and lenient, uh, 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 sane and lenient enforcement policy uh, uh, where we can make appropriate documented exceptions. So now let's talk about uh, 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 efforts to deliver software packages outside of uh, the sequence of canonical official releases. Uh, uh, so official releases take a certain amount of work and time for, to do the vetting and perform the vote. So an example of those would be nightly builds. Well, these are an attempt to get the software out other than version control, but they are technically not releases because they are destined for, uh, uh, for developers, not for users. Uh, and then the, another example would be source control. Uh, uh, that is definitely destined only for uh, developers. Uh, uh, some projects, such as FFmpeg and such, actually say uh, uh, you get the source code, we don't make releases. Uh, that's quite different from us. So in the, uh, Apache, at Apache, uh, these things which have not been vetted must not be advertised to users. That's the policy. Uh, Whoa, begging pardon. When <clears throat> I represent, or I'm part of Open Office. We use beta versions, which go out to end users, and we have had severe discussions. How do we see a beta version? Because it's a non-release, it hasn't gone through the normal unit testing, but we want the opinion of our end users before we cut the final release. So, what's your op opinion on that? Uh, the uh, uh, so I'm not in a position to enforce policy on that. Uh, uh, the official line on that would be that those are, if they have not been voted on, they are not releases. Uh, uh, and therefore, the policy is that they are not supposed to be provided to end users. Yes? Yeah, so, so with open office, we, we have two things. We have release candidates and we have beta. So the beta actually has a PMC code. Great. It didn't go through the QA process. I think that's the case of what protects the foundation. Yes, and that makes a great deal of, you know, that is a, uh, this is always an uncomfortable policy at the ASF, and for open office, I'm sure it's more uncomfortable than most others because of the vast uh, 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 testing requirements of all of those and the uh, uh, vast number of uh, uh, ultimately binaries that go out. So I understand exactly what you're, uh, uh, you're getting at there, and I don't discount that that is a, you know, the policy is uh, uh, perhaps not ideally suited to, uh, uh, to open office's needs. Uh, uh, but it's also true that other projects sometimes chafe under this policy as well. I mean, people have wanted to get out nightly builds to their users forever. Uh, uh, it seems like you folks are being quite conscientious about it, uh, 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 and so I hope that uh, we uh, uh, that that things are at least adequate now, uh, uh, and you know, we can work towards improvements as time goes on. So let's uh, actually now talk about another way of getting uh, releases to people more uh, quickly. A uh, related topic uh, is continuous delivery, and this is a, kind of arises from a des uh, design discipline, which is highly appropriate for web applications. And I'm actually going to address uh, continuous delivery in the context of web applications before we get to open source. 
So the primary uh, 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 determinant for uh, uh, continuous delivery is that the main line uh, is always kept ready to release. You typically do development in uh, feature branches, and they are merged only after sufficient uh, uh, testing to the main line only when ready. So instead of adding features to the main line and then working out the bugs uh, in advance prior to a release, you instead keep the main line always ready to release. Uh, and then that makes for, and then you release more often. And if you release more often, that means that there are smaller deltas between the releases, and that makes for easier troubleshooting because the surface area, which is subject to bugs, is smaller for any given release. So it makes it easier to isolate uh, what went wrong when something goes wrong. Now let's distinguish between what is called continuous delivery versus continuous deployment. And to a certain extent, these are just arbitrary terms which have arisen. Uh, but continuous delivery, in the, uh, uh, as far as the uh, buzzword definition of it goes, is that it is always ready to release. Whereas continuous deployment means actually every time that you hit commit on master, it gets shotgunned out to your, uh, your servers. We actually do that where I work. Uh, we do continuous deployment. Uh, and that has a lot of advantages in terms of uh, having a, uh, you know, all the troubleshooting and stuff like that. Uh, uh, however, uh, well, and then to uh, uh, continue on to that, one, introduce one more vocabulary word here. Sometimes the people in the continuous delivery and the DevOps movement speak of cadence of releases, by which they mean uh, uh, the speed at which releases are made. So high cadence means making a lot of frequent releases. So let's consider uh, uh, continuous delivery as applied to open source as opposed to for web applications. Well, one of the things is you can't really, in a, in a web application, you control all of the, uh, the end installations. And so if something goes wrong, it's quite easy to correct it by just saying, oops, revert that, send it right back out. That's not quite so easy to do for an open source because uh, uh, that has been, you don't know where all the end user in, uh, installations are. Uh, Another thing is that uh, open source just naturally imposes a uh, slower cadence on that. I mean, you're not going to release every uh, commit uh, unless you're FFmpeg. Uh, so uh, there is, however, a flavor of continuous delivery which is appropriate for open source, and that's releasing on a schedule. And that schedule uh, might be once a month, might be once a week, uh, Perl 5 uh, releases a uh, development version once a month and then releases a, a major release once a year and then occasionally as necessary bug fixes. So that's another, there's, a little, there's lots of different ways to do that. Jenkins also releases uh, 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 once a week and then makes, also maintains a stable branch in addition to that. So uh, uh, once again, you have the uh, release worthy mainline. Once again, that's a discipline that is required for this. Uh, the community effects of this are that uh, less work is, response, is necessary in the run-up to each release. You don't have this situation where you develop, 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 and then you have to get it to work on all the platforms right before the release, and so you have to work out all the bugs. Uh, and uh, this is actually somewhat controversial. Uh, some people at Apache, we had a discussion about this recently, and some people uh, feel that that's an opportunity for the community to come together. Uh, a lot of the people that actually do this kind of uh, discipline uh, uh, have the opposite take, which is that that's something that they would rather avoid and they're happy to see gone. And so they find that having a release which takes much less effort every time actually winds up having harmonious community effects. So this is something which is an, a topic of discussion around here these days. Uh, another thing that the, uh, the communities that perform continuous uh, or fixed cadence releases in the open source world appreciate is that uh, it allows them to be more responsive when people uh, uh, supply patches or bug reports. It means that when you, have, uh, when you supply a fix to a project, you ha can have a reasonable degree of confidence that unless something goes really wrong with one of the fixed cadence time to releases, that it's going to be out there within a, a reasonable uh, amount of time. And so there has been a number of projects which uh, do this. I mentioned Jenkins and Perl 5, Ubuntu, Firefox. There's a lot of others as well. This has been going on for uh, a few years now. So let's consider uh, fixed cadence releases at Apache. Uh, why not? Well, it turns out uh, there's really nothing stopping you. I mean, the only thing that, <laughs> that differentiates fixed cadence releases is that you release on a specific date. 
So instead of having the release manager pick some arbitrary time at which they prepare the artifacts, the release manager can instead simply uh, start the artifacts, prepare them on the date that uh, was announced in advance. So uh, that being said, uh, we have a certain amount of release overhead uh, in terms of the vote itself, which takes 72 hours, and then the propagation of the, uh, of the, uh, the artifacts to the uh, distribution system, which takes typically 24. And so that, if you try and do, say, weekly releases like Jenkins, then that's going to, now you're going to have a four-day delay built into every one of those weekly releases. And that maybe uh, you know, limits the tempo or somehow makes things a little less convenient. However, in my experience, there's been a couple of projects which uh, have notably wanted to do this lately. And you know, if you have a really complicated build system and it takes a long time to even prepare the release candidate, then maybe the vote uh, is not necessarily the thing uh, which is the, the long pole holding up the tent. So uh, finally, let's uh, consider the, uh, the case of uh, binaries. The party line, the official rule is the uh, Apache Software Foundation, is that uh, the ASF only releases source code and that binaries uh, are supplied by uh, community members. And that has two meanings. It means that we don't, you're not supposed to have binary dependencies bundled in source releases. And you're also not supposed to have, uh, or that the, the, the ASF does not supply the binaries that are officially sanctioned by the organization itself. And when we consider the uh, uh, rationale behind this decision, when we consider uh, the quality control and the oversight that goes into source code, if you have release point A, and then uh, uh, you have in between release point A and release point B, you have PMC members following every commit that gets sent, uh, message that gets sent to the commit list, then you can have a high degree of confidence that when you check that the uh, artifacts, the expanded artifacts for the little release, you check that against a version control tag, that if that matches, then you can have a high degree of confidence that the release is the sum of all the deltas that you actually inspected, and that therefore, you have, although you are not able to uh, actually inspect the lines of every, source every line of source code in the, in the release, that you can still have a high degree of confidence that you've quality uh, checked that thing over a long period of time. The problem is that oversight mechanism does not work for binaries because binaries are not technically open source. They are the, or some would argue, that uh, they are the combination of open source uh, uh, files and a build environment. And the PMC members do not have insight into that build environment. It is an opaque thing to them. So they cannot properly uh, uh, quality control a build environment. If, say, the build environment was uh, uh, maliciously corrupted, you would not necessarily have a chance to see that. We have a model that uh, the, the way around this was, uh, in theory, that people would, uh, third parties, would create branded binaries that the ASF would release source and that the downstream you would have someone is t uh, reusing that source and then uh, preparing a branded version that the, then those uh, companies would be able to make some amount of money off of those binaries and that they would then assume the cost and risk of building and distributing those binaries and that they would maintain uh, secure build machines. Because a secure build machine is a fairly difficult thing to, uh, uh, to maintain in an, open, uh, in an open collaboration environment, because it, if it has to be on the internet, then it is a serious uh, target for hackers. So uh, the challenge of this, though, is that really it, there's a lot of desire out in the marketplace for an Apache-branded binary. So as much as we might like this system to work out where we produce the source code and downstream produces the binaries, in practice for a lot of projects, uh, the house brand seems to be preferred. And uh, uh, this is an uncomfortable situation. The ASF doesn't, uh, lacks the commercial, uh, it can't really make a profit off of its own binaries, so it, uh, it just does the best it can with that. Uh, and, but the Apache branded binary uh, sucks up the oxygen in the marketplace and makes it impossible for somebody downstream to really compete with that. 
So it's a, it's, it's a challenging situation. Uh, it's not something that we really have worked out in, uh, in a perfect way. So now, uh, as we approach the end here, uh, I'm going to just assess, uh, make some uh, opinions as to whether or not uh, some aspects of the release process have withstood the test of time. Uh, so let's consider technology first. Uh, the mechanism of compressed source archives, uh, that seems to work. Uh, it seems that, that hasn't really changed. The sums and signatures, those, uh, we always have advancing uh, needs with regards to those because peop, uh, cryptographic measures get compromised, and so we have to keep increasing them. But the general institution of that has stayed largely OK. The mirror network was pretty much OK until OpenOffice showed up, but then we adjusted. Uh, and then uh, th th I would say is that we have compressed source archives, uh, and we have the mirror network. But those are often augmented uh, by other distribution channels, by uh, other mechanisms, rebrandings, et cetera. So uh, uh, the nice thing, though, is that the original mechanisms remain compatible with the augmentations which have been made. Now let's also consider uh, how the voting culture has uh, worked out. Uh, we have uh, the voting mechanism of uh, majority rule and such. That has wor uh, worked quite well. It speaks well of the process that we have uh, that fixed cadence actually turned out to be compatible with the uh, uh, Apache release process. Uh, but one thing I would say is that the policy documentation has not scaled. Uh, and that is a problem that results in internal inefficiency. Uh, it, doesn't, it also causes a certain amount of problems for downstream because we have releases which contain mistakes, but, uh, uh, and more mistakes because the policy is not clear. But this is, and this is largely a fixable problem, but it's a certain extent costly to actually evolve this documentation and develop consensus. And then finally, I will say that uh, uh, with regards to binaries, there seems to be a changing marketplace where the, there is a ever-increasing demand for the uh, Apache brand. And that uh, is uh, perhaps the situation has not worked out uh, exactly as we might have liked. But having a high degree of, uh, of desire for the Apache brand, well, really, that's kind of a nice problem to have. And I think I'll leave it there uh, and uh, take any questions that may still be remaining. If anyone has the microphone. Um, so my question is just for si signing packages, you already, if we, you know, we check that the zip file has all of the files in it that we expect, and we have the hash to make sure the zip file doesn't change for some reason, what, what is the point of signing it? Oh, uh, so uh, it is a stronger measure uh, uh, when you, uh, so this is, this gets into PGP uh, uh, and the web of trust. And I think that I will not be able to explain the web of trust. Uh, uh, I know it well enough to make use of it, but I would not consider myself an expert. Uh, there are a number of people here, uh, particularly uh, associated with the infrastructure team, who will be able to answer that question as to why the PGP signatures are a uh, stronger measure of confidence than uh, the, sum, and the checksums. And that's what the infrastructure team uses when they want to verify a release. Uh, they, they use the, uh, uh, the signatures. Anybody else? Okay. Oh, well. Could you clarify the binaries again? Do you really mean uh, no binaries in source to be uh, binaries just compiled code versus resources? In our uh, project, we have uh, statistical models where it just happens to be binary. But could those be allowed in, uh, in your source? Yeah, so, so it's really the idea here is that we don't want something which is o opaque and unauditable. Uh, and that generally comes as a result of tr source code being transformed into an object format. And uh, uh, so we would prefer to have the source code. That being said, I mean, there, we, sensible exceptions need to be made. And uh, uh, there are certainly circumstances under which, uh, you know, somebody putting a zip file into the, uh, into the of, of, uh, of, of test cases into the, uh, because the, that's, that's clearly a, uh, okay. So, uh, I, I don't think that there's somebody's going to say your release needs to be hauled off of the uh, out of the mirror network because of something like that. It needs to be addressed on a case by case basis. Let me pass the microphone to that gentleman. <laughs> 
that I've also seen is where a distribution or the, where the, the source zip is also transformed into a packaging system that's then network hosted. So it's not a source zip, but it's not opaque either. So it's in, so in essence, if you have something that's scriptable like JavaScript or Perlscript where you put it into um, uh, uh, a package repository, is that considered to be binary? even though it's not opaque, or would there be concerns about doing something like that? So, yeah, so actually, the project that I work on does that because uh, uh, we release a canonical source. Uh, uh, this is the Apache Lucy project. It's a small uh, uh, C slash Perl based project. And what we do is we actually have, uh, uh, when we take our so uh, canonical source archive, we then transform it and have only include only certain files for our CPAN release. That is considered downstream of the canonical source release. I don't think that there's, it's certainly, not, it's still a source release. It happens to not be the canonical source release that we vote on at the Apache Software Foundation. Does that sufficiently answer that question? I think so. It, it sounds like bottom line is it's a downstream release, but not necessarily considered to be a binary. It's, it, the important thing is that the Apache cares about having a source release, which is then uh, uh, vetted and voted upon. And that is what ends up on uh, archive.apache.org. That is the canonical thing, which is the act of the foundation. You can do any number of additional transformations after that. That has to be the choke point through which uh, 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 code moves from the source uh, repository to the wider audience. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. This is not actually a release question, so more on the licensing side. So if a project depends on the third party libraries, so uh, we include the notice uh, TXT, right? Notice file. I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of difficulty understanding you, so you please say that again. Uh, so uh, what I'm saying is if the project depends on a third party library, we include uh, uh, saying that it is, it is depending on the, on the third party library in the notice file. Right, notice txt. Yes, so you, yes, you say that you are depending on the, the library in the uh, in the notice file, okay. which and is sometimes a requirement to, depending on the license okay, of the. Okay, so that has to be uh, maintained by PMC, and uh, that is required before you make a release. Yes, the notice file for the source release must uh, accurately reflect the licensing of the source package, and it must only reflect the content of the source package itself. Uh, uh, it is only the bits that are bundled that matter. But if there must be, uh, uh, this is something which we often get wrong in the incubator or that projects often get wrong. It must reflect only this, uh, uh, the content of the, uh, uh, of the artifacts themselves and not something which has to be downloaded separately. Does that answer your question? So uh, my question is like, who should maintain that? The, the PMC should maintain it or? Yes, the community must maintain that. Okay. I think we are now out of time. So uh, thanks very much, everyone. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>